All right, we now welcome on two-time NBA champion Greg Kite. Greg, how we doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, great to be with you, Carter. Great to be with you as well. So let's just start this off. What led you to BYU? Um, I tend to, I think it was I, I 45 or something. <laughs> oh, what got me? That was the roads that got me there from Houston, <laughs> Texas. Um, but we, uh, I had a little bit of family background. My mom was from, uh, her mom was from the Salt Lake area of Spanish Fork actually. And, and they moved back down from Canada when my mom was 10. And so my mom and, her, and all, I think all of her five, uh, five sisters went to BYU. So I had a little fa family history there. And I had uh, two older sisters who spent some years there. One of them, one or both of them graduated there. And my brother graduated. So it was definitely a, a, a family thing. But I was recruited by a lot of schools all over the country and uh, had some great choices. I kind of narrowed it down to UCLA, Duke, BYU, Kentucky, Texas, University of Houston. And, uh, but it was just a, it was the right place for me. Um, uh, things were going, starting to pick up there basketball wise when they'd had a little bit of down period a few years before. And uh, so it was a great place, not only athletically, but I knew socially, academically, spiritually, all those things were, uh, was the right place for me. So if you didn't go to BYU, what was your second choice? BYU, Idaho, Rick's college, of course, <laughs> back then, no. It was Rick's back then. I wasn't thinking about going to Rick's, but, um, I, you know, I, don't, I never really thought of it that way. I mean, like I said, I went to kind of narrowed it down, had a lot of schools recruiting me and I went to, uh, some visits and they were all attractive places. Um, maybe if I hadn't stayed home, which I wasn't leaning that way in Texas, probably, uh, Kentucky, I'm sorry, probably Duke or UCLA. That's probably what I would have done. Okay, let's talk about that Notre Dame game in the Sweet 16. But never the University of Utah. Never the so. University of Utah. There we go. <laughs> <They actually, laughs> That's what we like to my, hear. They actually were on about my final dozen list when I was at, before my senior year, but it, we eliminated them. And uh, Good call. Was, uh, we, we, we actually had some, some connections there. The great, great school, great basketball program, but, you know, it is what it is. So, <laughs> so on that final play in the BYU-Notre Dame game in the Sweet 16 – did Frank Arnold draw up that play? He did, but, you know, I was wide open. And Ainge still would pass to me. <laughs> Steve Trumbo was wide open on the other side of the basket, too. But you just Frank had to get all fancy, doing. huh? Co Coach Arnold and, 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 uh, and, and Danny knew, knew what they were doing. Yeah, you get a, you get a last-second opportunity. You give it to your best scorer and best shooter. But, uh, yeah, literally, I think it was Tim Andre and – Orlando Woolridge guard the Notre Dame players, big guys, guarding me and and uh, Steve Trumbo, and coach just had us down on the blocks, you know, hey, there for the dish off or get a rebound, if there's a miss, and and our our guys stepped up to help, and Danny just shot it over, I think Orlando Woolridge tore his arm out of his shoulder <laughs> socket, trying to get to that teardrop that Danny put up there, but uh, no, it was a well, it was a phenomenal play, and it was obviously the farthest that. The, any BYU teams ever gone? I hope somebody breaks it soon. I hope one of Mark Coach Pope's teams can break it. But getting to the final eight, and it was a great, uh, also a great experience for us with the with the, uh, the the church and recognition for the school and just just a lot of fun to go that far. But then we ran into Big Ralph Sampson the next game. <laughs> <laughs> so you leave BYU. It's draft night. Where did you expect to end up? I really wasn't sure. It wasn't as maybe. Uh, clear cut as it is now, although even now, you know, you get down past the first few picks and there's often changes in maneuvering, but, um, yeah, you know, back then we had the, uh, NBA pre-draft camp like they have now, and I was able to go there and, and performed well. And I went to, uh, um, what was then called the Aloha classic. I don't think it's around. It was probably the top, uh, senior uh, all-star game for college graduating seniors and did did well out there and one of the big things I did was keep myself got good advice and get myself in really good shape after the season had seen some guys even a, even another BYU teammate from earlier years had gotten drafted and and, and kind of affected them there so uh, that kind of uh, that uh, postseason experience there in the combine and Aloha Classic helped me and uh, we just kind of went into the draft 
uh, knowing that I might be a late first round pick, maybe, a, but maybe more likely a high second round pick. And so I was 21st uh, picked by the Celtics. There were only 23 teams in the league. So near the end of the first round, but they had just uh, not long before the draft had traded a backup center, Rick Roby to um, Phoenix Suns for Dennis Johnson. So they were looking for another backup big guy. So it worked out. They fit. We had played that year, uh, my senior year in, in, in uh, Madison Square Garden in New York, in uh, whatever it was called, the the Garden Square, whatever the classic was called with St. John's and, and St. Joe's and some others. And, and uh, I know Red Auerbach had been down there scouting that. So that helped. They actually were, you know, and Red had even said they were looking, they were hoping to get Roy Henson. Mm-hmm. who was at a Rutgers 6'9", 6'10", really long arms. And he got picked to pick before me by um, whoever it was, Philadelphia or whatever, picked before me, before the Celtics. So your first year, you walk into the Celtics locker room. It's Larry Bird, all these legends. Were you intimidated or were they, like, really welcoming? The locker room was small, so <laughs> <laughs> didn't stand there too long. It wasn't like these locker rooms these days, like that new BYU football locker room. Wow. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and basketball locker rooms are always smaller, but we, we practice a little uh, uh, Greek Orthodox college and, and, and uh, gym wasn't any bigger than, than you have in most uh, church gyms. And, uh, but uh, no, I wasn't, I wasn't intimidated. It was kind of a natural thing, you know, cause you got that basketball circadian rhythm from so many, you know, from going back to 10, 11 years old, you're playing and building up to the season and, and the school season you know, high school season was a big thing then, not so much like they do now where travel ball season, mm-hmm. AAU is a big season, but uh, and, and in college, you're building up to that season. So it just seemed natural to be playing. And over the years through my high school and, and college years, um, you know, you played with some players who went to the pros or I get to play, you know, in off season, sometimes those guys are already in the pros. So I wasn't intimidated or awed by that, but I would step back sometimes and, you know, after a practice or something, go, wow, I'm here with, you know, Bird and McHale and Robert Parrish. And, and uh, I'll tell you a quick story, too. One of our first times, at the, probably an exhibition game, but we play in Philadelphia. And, uh, you know, you go out 730 game, you might be out there at six to between six and seven, stretching, warming up, shooting. And so I'm out there and, uh, and Dr. J comes out and Julius walks by me and says, hi, Greg. And I look around, I guess he knows my name, you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> so I guess he was studying the scouting, re- scouting report, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it was, it was great, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really intimidating, but it is an adjustment, you know, playing against those guys. So what's your favorite bird story? Um, man, there's, there's a lot of good ones. So um, he's just, uh, he, he was one of the best trash talkers of all time. <laughs> Because probably, and you can you can Google that. That's easy to get on YouTube. And the great thing about Larry with that, not only could he back it up, but it was, I think, part of how he got his mind, you know, into the game. And um, it wasn't like it was a macho braggadocio thing. It was more of a strategic thing. I'm going to get in this guy's head, you know. And uh, sometimes it affects him, sometimes it doesn't. But if nothing else, he had fun with it. And so, um, but he was also really confident. So we're playing the the Knicks in. Uh, Madison Square Garden, and uh, their trainer was named Mike Saunders, and uh, Larry had been out shooting or something early, and he got to talk with Mike, and, and, and they had a little friendly bet, and he said, you know, Saunders said, Larry, I bet you five bucks that you won't ba- bank in a three-pointer during the game, and Larry said, you're on, and so <laughs> they get down to the game, Larry probably forgotten about it, and it's like a close game, we're down like two points, and uh, it's dead ball. Somebody's shooting free throws. It's like a minute left. And, and Mike Saunders gets a, um, uh, catches Larry's attention he's right there by the next bench. And he's going five, <laughs> smiling like, I got you. You know, <laughs> this game's almost over and you haven't done it. So the very next trip down the court, Larry gets the ball. We're down two, mind you, in a close game. Banks in a three-pointer and comes back and goes five. <laughs> I mean, what was it like day-to-day going to practice, being on the road with those guys? Oh, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, they, uh, everybody uh, got on each other hard. We, we cracked on each other. We had uh, uh, a lot of great personalities, some very, uh, you know, outgoing guys like Kevin McHale and 
ML Carr and Danny and, and uh, 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 Cedric Maxwell, just funny guys, and but also really veteran guys who are really pros and understood the value of being ready and working hard and uh, not having any negative, uh, you know, vibes on the team. And uh, and then in practice, we competed hard, and it really even picked up its pace. Maybe read stories before, but we. You know, we had these reversible practice jerseys, white and green, so the subs of the green team. And uh, when Bill Walton joined us in 1986, it went to a whole new level uh, as far as competing with the, uh, you know, practice. So we were very, very competitive in practice. And you, you got to realize in NBA practice, especially when you get in the season, you have a very few stretches where you really get to go live because there's so many games. But we went after it, even if it was for short spurts and even if those uh, – Bird and Mikhail and those guys were tired. We still pushed them. Part of what made us a better team, a great team. So how intense were those Lakers Celtics games? Like going into the game, was, were there nerves involved or was it more just like ready to run through a brick wall kind of thing? Uh, they were very intense. Maybe the maybe the brick wall. I think we were smarter than run, running through a brick wall. But um, <laughs> it was, um, it was you know, the – the tradition of the, of the rivalry between the two teams, you know, the biggest two rivals in the NBA, all the championships is there. Being on that stage in the mid '80s, where you know, through the '80s, the Lakers or Celtics, one of one or both of them, was in every NBA Finals. You know, so the, I think the Celtics in five, four or five, and the, and the Lakers. So it was just, it was just great being a part of that Magic Bird era. The whole uh, sporting world, it seemed like, and certainly the whole basketball world. Uh, focused on that and then just uh, the atmosphere in the Boston Garden and the LA Forum you couldn't beat it and and you know and it built up too I mean the guys really had um, respect but but kind of a, a competitive animosity you know for the other each other's teams and uh, we would watch all season long I don't know if guys do this now they, they ought to if they don't because it's stupid if they don't but you know having the best because having a home court advantage in the playoffs is really uh, important so we would look all season long about did we have the best record did we have the best record in the east were we better than philly were we better than milwaukee or whoever was uh, you know closest but also in the league so we could have that home court advantage if we faced the lakers or whoever it was coming out of the out of the west and it, it was intense so we, there was uh my rookie year we played them in a um, 84 7 game uh, nba finals we won in game seven and the next next year, probably because it's hard to sell, may have been harder even those days to sell tickets for a lot of exhibition games. Mm -hmm. We played the Lakers four times in exhibition games. <laughs> I think I think one was in, and one was in the forum. And in that game in the forum, in the exhibition game, there was a, a, a fight that broke out, and it was just kind of spilling, spilled over from just that intensity and that kind of that bad blood from the the playoffs. So it's it's just uh, you know it was. It was real. It was there. So Bill Walton comes in. What was your first impression of him? First impression? I'm not sure. Um, one, Bill was Bill's a lot taller than he says he is. He's probably <laughs> about seven two. He says he's six eleven, which is which is which is not true. But but Bill was a uh, Bill was a, f a a fun guy. He's got a real uh, sarcastic wit, dry sense of humor, and we made fun of him a lot too. But he was also and you see him, if you watch him broadcasting, you know, you know how enthusiastic he is mm -hmm. and kind of off the wall, which is to me is kind of fun listening to him. But he's also he's also a big, you know, proponent of winning and good basketball. And he's, he compliments guys on the floor. And like a, as a teammate, he was like that. He really and, you know, as a player, that's what he was. I mean, 88 game winning streak and, in, 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 you know, the NCAA record in college at UCLA and then uh, a champion with the the. Portland Trailblazers and uh, and then a champion with us with the Celtics, which he was so grateful to get back to because, you know, his his career was so hobbled by injuries, especially mm -hmm. at the pro level. He had dozens and dozens of surgeries and operations on his feet and his knees. And uh, even as limited as he was when he came to the Celtics in his thirties, he was he did some things on the court as 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 well as anybody I've ever seen in the game. What's your favorite Bill Walton story? Um, Bill, um, so, you know, Bill's a big Grateful Dead fan. Mm -hmm. And, um, so 
uh, they, uh, you know, we'd fly into San Francisco and he goes, Oh, Berkeley, the capital of the world, you know? So <laughs> anyway, he's, he, he's like, so the dead go, we used to go, I don't I guess they don't nowadays, but they used to go on these tours or concert tours and they, and they go to, and all the deadheads follow them. They, you know, they mm-hmm. caravan and camp out. And so they're in, uh, they come to the Boston area for about a week because they play, uh, Providence, Rhode Island and Worcester, Mass about an hour from Boston, they play like three shows or three or four shows at each place. And so they're there about a week. So at practice during that week, during those years, uh, some of the guys from the band, and this is like 10, 11 a.m. in the morning, would come to the practice. You know, and these guys, uh, I don't remember all the names, but uh, Phil Lesh, I think, Phil Weir, Weir, Hart, Kretzman, I can remember some last names, come to the practice and we go, we go, Bill, when, when's Jerry Garcia going to come to come to practice? And, and Bill says, he says, Jerry hasn't seen daylight since 1968, <laughs> <laughs> which is probably true. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I mean, so then, yeah, then then they, I didn't go, and Danny didn't go, but there's a great story about uh, the, the, some of the guys, most of the guys on the team went with Bill to the Dead concert out in Worcester, and they got him up on the stage and gave him tambourines and maracas and stuff <laughs> like that. <laughs> So how fun was that 86 season? Oh, it was a blast. I mean, all those seasons with the Celtics were a blast, but we were rolling then. I mean, we didn't, um, we went, we lost one game at home to the Portland Trailblazers in December. And I don't think anybody's, maybe somebody's matched that, but nobody's beat that. Um, We had a goal, which uh, I guess we did the years before, but I really remember that and not losing two games in a row. And we did it the whole regular season until the last two games when they played guys like me and Rick Carlisle and <laughs> Sam Vincent a lot more because it, it, it was wrapped up and they were resting guys a little bit and we lost those two. But, and then we rolled through the playoffs. I think we didn't win, lose more than one game in a series until we got to the finals against the Rockets. And I think that was 4-2. But um, we were really clicking. And that, and that green team, that second unit, you know, we'd be in and uh, – you know, some of us would be in, in individually with starters and sometimes even as a unit. And we were, uh, it was great. And Bird was, uh, I guess, MVP that year and healthy and Kevin was healthy and Chief and Dennis Johnson. So it was a, it was a phenomenal year. Our only, our only, it was awesome. We loved playing the Houston Rockets and they had Olajuwon and Samson. They were at their peak, but um, they they'd kind of upset the Lakers. Mm-hmm. So it would have been in, in, the, in the West. It'd been interesting to see if we could have, played the Lakers I mean they were very very dangerous and as good as we were who knows yeah because the ball movement from the 86 team if you watch highlights is just the only thing I can compare it to that I've seen is the 2015 Warriors yeah you see sometimes where where I've seen some of those highlights where they're they're just passing and we really did move the ball well yeah it's not even like looking with your eyes it's just you just know where these guys are you know where these guys are and then, then you just get you know people get a and, and and a lot of pro players have it, but unfortunately, there's some even there who don't. But it's really developing a, a basketball IQ. I mean, it's cl- it's individual experience, but it's also collective experience playing together. But when you had a lot of guys who played together for a number of years there, plus then you had savvy veterans come in to that 86 teams like Jerry Seasting and Bill Walton. They uh, those, those magic moments could happen, you know, and just some of those pa- and you know, and, and passing. I mean, Larry and Bill or two of the best passers, you know, I've, I've ever played with in, in pro basketball. So your time in Boston comes to an end and you end up at the Clippers. I talked, I mentioned to Thurl Bailey about this when he left the jazz and went to the Timberwolves. Does basketball just become more of a job then when you're on those losing teams? Um, it's a pretty darn good job, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> so it's true. I'd, it, wasn't, it wasn't like digging a ditch, man, or, or it's playing a game and getting paid. So, it, it was still fun. Uh, people come to watch you work, which doesn't happen mm-hmm. in too many occupations. And uh, so it was still fun, but it was as far as, as far as uh, team atmosphere, organization atmosphere, uh, winning, it was the opposite end of the spectrum with the Clippers or probably with most uh, uh, teams that are at the bottom of the standings. And uh, so, um, and the Clippers were in those years, I think I went to them and they were the, uh, worst or next to worst record in the league mm-hmm. for me the upside was 
young players often don't get a lot of, particularly unless you're going to develop into like a Devin Booker or Trey Young or something like that. You don't get a lot of uh, playing time on, on championship contending teams. So, you know, I maybe played my 10 minutes a game, my most, and in 70 of the games at the best with the, the Celtics and not a lot of chances to go out there and make mistakes and learn from your mistakes. So going to the Clippers for a year and a half and then the Kings after that, not another team with a weak record. And then even the Orlando Magic, all those were, were good experiences where I got to play a lot more and help me to, with my uh, improving and, and hanging on in the so league. I've, I've always been curious about this. When you're at the bottom of the league, I mean, not much is good. You're, you don't have much of a chance of going far. And do you guys even care after they lose in the regular season? I, I think the guys who stick around the game a long time did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, there's some guys who, who might not, and it is easy with easier when you're not winning for things to get a little more, you know, the, the, the petty things that go on with team chemistry or, mm-hmm. or just kind of, you know, as Charles Barkley says, one, two, three Cancun, you know, <laughs> I'm getting ready for getting ready for, for vacation. But at the same time, you know, just like myself, other guys, and, and in those days, you know, you didn't have the contracts they had, even for the starters, you're really still playing for the next year or the future. Mm-hmm. And, um, and like I said, if you really, to get to that level, for the most part for guys, you're, you're, you're pretty darn competitive and you're going to go out there and compete anyway. It wasn't like with those bad teams, at least in my mind, that I, I thought we, we wouldn't win, couldn't win the game. Mm-hmm. And we went out thinking that we would win the game. And with the Clippers, we, um, one day we built one of the games we beat, the Pistons, you know, who were 89 champions that year or in the finals. Now they may have had a little too much LA nightlife <laughs> or something the night before, but, but we put it on them. So um, any team, even, even the bad teams in the league can, 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 can beat you. It's just over that, that long haul. They can't sustain it, you know? So you're in Orlando, Shaq comes in. What's your first impression of Shaq? Uh, big daddy. Shaq was unique. You know, he was, he had a, body by body built by Fisher, like GM, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so, and literally our coach, uh, Matt Gukas at the time, who was the coach the, the years I was there until two Shaq's first year, I believe Matt had been a rookie with the Philadelphia, then Philadelphia warriors mm-hmm. when Shaq was, uh, I mean, when Wilt Chamberlain was like about 27, 28 years old. And he said, and it was, and it, it was true, you know, saw, that the only guy he could ever physically, physically compare to Shaq was, was, was Will. Maybe built a little bit differently, but still seven one ish with long arms, big hands, and uh, very athletic, very powerful. And power is really the, uh, the component that really sets you apart in any sport. And, uh, and he was just so quick and strong. He could go through guys, over guys, around guys. He, he had fun. He loved to play. So, uh, and after two years of starting, most of the time before he was there they gave him my starting job and they never explained why and i'm still <laughs> still on i still haven't figured it out but uh anyway no uh, it was he was pretty darn good i knew uh it was actually a pretty good deal for me to maybe hey be a backup for him which worked out for about a year and a half till i got hurt so yeah you you start getting hurt and you realize the end of your career is coming at some people i know some athletes say they die twice you know once your career ends was it tough realizing like, oh crap, what am I going to do after basketball? Uh, I had a lot of interest that, you know, things I wanted to do after basketball mm-hmm. and already got into some things. But the biggest thing is for me, yeah, it was, it's, it, it's hard. I think it's hard for most players who, who, uh, whenever it ends is that you're so competitive and you've done it for so long. And then plus you got, it's, uh, you know, anytime you do anything that's exciting and gets you going, whether it's, you know, riding motorcycles or playing a sport or, singing or doing music you get that adrenaline going you know so you become a uh, adrenaline neurotransmitter junkie if you will <laughs> so it's really hard to replace that you know and uh you know golf or even coaching does it a little bit but it's not quite the same you know so um so just missing that you know missing that uh being in great shape that com- camaraderie that that being able to compete at that high high level uh is something you you, you miss and takes a takes your mind and body a while to adjust to but uh as far as keeping busy and doing other things i my problem is not 
not knowing what to do. It's just trying to not do too much. <laughs> so do you watch basketball today? Oh, yeah. I, I watch. I still help coach at the high school level. And um, I'm actually commissioner of a minor league basketball called the Florida Basketball Association. I don't have to spend a lot of time with that. But I'm on my way tonight. We've got a, 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 a it's a private school. It's called Pathways School in Orlando. Um, I helped them start there. It's been around 25 years. My wife and I helped to start the school, but we just started high school and high school sports about five years ago. So we've got the high school summer league championship game tonight. I'm leaving okay. Good <laughs> I'm luck. Here a little bit to, to, to get ready for that. But, uh, um, so, um, do you like so how it's as played? far as watching the game? Yeah. What's that? Do you, do you like how it's played today? Oh, it's different. You know, I'm watching all the NBA playoff games. Mm -hmm. When you get to the playoffs, you like good teams. I'm sad the Jazz lost and the Celtics mm -hmm. weren't any further in it. But uh, I really like right now the the, uh, the Suns and uh, I like the Bucks and the uh, and the uh, and the Atlanta Hawks are really winning me over too. They're pretty intriguing and they and they play so in general. These teams that get to the end, even though the style of the game's a little bit different in some ways, it's. Um, uh, it's still really good because you don't get this far without being a, a good team, without good ball movement, pretty good defense. Um, there's some things that have changed in the game, and some have just been some trends and analytics, mm -hmm. but others have been the rule changes. And that's the thing um, that did about 2005 that I've got a little bit of a issue with that I think that the uh, – and here there's a little talk of it if the NBA would back off of that because they mm -hmm. they eliminated a lot of the physicality on defense and they did it for marketing reasons. Yep. They did it because the scoring totals got low in the uh, in the 90s in the Jordan era and the post Jordan era. You had a few good teams like the Knicks and the and the Pistons or the Heat who would grind it out and it could compete but you had a lot of bad teams that were using the whole shot clock and trying to keep it or average team so they could keep the game close. Mm -hmm. And so game scoring in, uh, in the 70s and 80s weren't real uh, appealing to the fans and, and teams averaging 90 points. So, you know, 2005, they limited hand checking uh, for, on the ball handlers. They limited how you could bump or disrupt the, the weak side off the ball cutters and they, and, they, and they lightened up a little bit on the post play. And so you watch them now, you know, you can't, no wonder, I mean, those guys are great ball handlers and quick, but they can get every, almost everybody who's, who's got some speed, get up ahead of steam, get to the basket because they can't mm -hmm. they can't touch them or impede their progress. And then, you know, on these shooters, if there's any sort of minimal contact, it's a foul and they're falling down and and scoring's up. But you know, it's also interesting. Nobody's ever mentioned this except me. So you're in on a good good secret. You go back and look at our Celtics teams and the teams and and not only the Celtics but all the NBA teams in the in the in the 80s and the 70s. The scoring totals were just as high today as with the same rules, and we didn't shoot as many threes. So, some differences. So, you know, if a team's averaging 120 points a game, is it any different than them averaging 112 or something? Mm -hmm. So, that's There's the only thing I'd like. I'd like to see a little bit, a little bit more, letting the defense be a little bit more physical, and then also, uh, I love the post game, and it'd be great to see, um, you know, a little bit more post play. And that's yeah. a good combination with, with spread the floor and the threes. And, you know, the mm -hmm. trajectory of the threes being shot is just going off the charts. But it's also some due to the analytics. Yeah, because back in the – you watch those 86 games and back in the 80s and stuff, there's real flow to these games. Now it's just replay after replay after timeout after TV timeout, get their commercials in. Does that bother you? Uh, well, there's always been the timeouts and TV broadcast games. I don't mm -hmm. know if they've – Increase those, but the, uh, but the, but the, uh, um, what are the, the replays where they go and watch for the, the play? And it's 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 a little too much. And just like in that, I don't know the Phoenix the Phoenix game the other night where ridiculous teams are out of timeouts and they and they and they're replaying this thing on out of bounds. It went off of, so it gives Phoenix the time to set up a great play, and and and, and score the winning basket. So. Uh, I'm, I'm with Jeff Van Gundy, who's kind of answered. I wish they could, they could minimize that, you know, take it out. It's it's nice, it's nice to, to figure out who the ball went off of, or if this was a foul or not. But and some of that stuff is tied into the physicality too, because mm -hmm. they're going and looking at everything that sometimes is just a 
basketball play and trying to figure out whether it was a flagrant or not. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, these guys aren't dying. If they get clipped in the chops once in a while, accidentally or even a little intentionally, they'll be okay, you know? Yep. And so, yeah. But, um, yeah, there's not a lot of um, as much off the ball movement now and not a lot of screening. There's a lot of pick and rolls, high pick and rolls and things like that, but it's a lot of spread the floor and, uh, and and crank it up. And and you know what's down, too, is although like Atlanta last night did a great job with it, uh, offensive rebounding is down. Mm-hmm. So there's yeah, an I mean, opportunity if you want to go get a bucket, go get a offensive <laughs> rebound. Do you think you would have done well in today's game? Well, I'd been shooting threes like crazy, <laughs> like uh, like Brooke Lopez or something. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there wouldn't be the what for the way I played. You know, no, there wouldn't be as much demand. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's actually you know limited. Yeah, not that it wasn't somewhat limited anyway. Then just because I didn't uh, perform that well offensively, but um, but I certainly would have. I didn't show it much in early years, but a little bit with those bad teams, I did step out and shoot, you know, 15, 17 footers. And so for a guy with the, you know, it's tough in the middle with, with, with really big, long guys, a lot of people <laughs> to get shots off. So I can understand out there and, and heck, you know, if, if these guys can stand out there and shoot three pointers, I'm sure some of the mentality of it is it's a lot less um, taxing than going to the bucket mm-hmm. and getting your, getting, you know, knocked around. And uh, so, um, so nope. you just adjust with the games and, and people and people have a green light too. I mean, I mean, they're not, you know, they don't want a guy shooting 25% and go crank up threes, but there's people shooting two or three, four gamers, 33%. So. So against the guys you played against who talked the most trash besides bird. Um, I'm not sure. I wasn't always up next to the guys who did. <laughs> Gary Payton was really good at it. I think Gary, Gary Payton, and I'm sure. Uh, did anybody ever get under your? Jordan seat? did probably a little bit, but Jordan wasn't. Uh, he was scared of me, so he didn't say anything to me. <laughs> uh, anybody get under my skin? Uh, get under my fingernails sometimes when they <laughs> grab <laughs> the ball. But no, they, their skin got under me. Um, so. Uh, no, not in particular. I mean, I, they were all, uh, it was all okay. You know, there's the old beer land beer story. I know a lot of guys didn't, don't, don't, still don't, don't like him. <laughs> and our, our GM in Boston called him the consummate provocateur. And Bill was a really good player. He was a really smart player, but he was uh, definitely good at, 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 at provoking stuff. And he had a couple of plays you're going like this, it's just over the top <laughs> where he took guys out. But, um, all right, so last question, then I'll let you go. Who's the funniest guy you've played with in the NBA? Funniest guy? Um, might be Cedric Maxwell. Max Max was really, really funny. <laughs> yeah, funny guy, yeah. He was there He was there when I got to the Celtics, and he'd been a starter. Then he became sixth man for a while when Kevin transitioned. And then they um, he was involved in the trade that brought Bill Walton in. And, and, and Max still does uh, – uh, broadcasting for the Celtics and has some funny lines. So Cedric was funny, but there, there are a lot, a lot of funny guys. I mean, you have, you're around a team, you're around a locker room, you got a lot mm-hmm. of fun, fun going on, but an actual, you know, do you have a good, Cedric certainly story? A rod of, what's that? Do you have a good Max? A good story? Cedric story. Yep. Oh uh, yeah. Here's one. Cedric, there was a guy named uh, Dan Roundfield. Well, a couple of them here. So Dan Roundfield played for the Hawks mostly when we were playing it. He would always have, and, and Cedric kind of liked or admired Dan or something. He was about a six nine forward. Cedric could guard him, and so Ralph would often come out with like wristbands, an elbow pad, a knee brace, whatever it was, two or three, three, four different things on. So Cedric just clowning around would go out and see what Roundfield was wearing during before the pregame warmups, and he'd go out and match him. He'd go put the same thing on <laughs> just to wear the same, same, same thing, and then. Um, so this is this is a little bit longer story, but Danny. So Danny played in, in uh, you know, played pro baseball. Danny Ainge played pro baseball with the Blue mm-hmm. Jays, and uh, Danny told a lot of good baseball stories. And one of them was about closing the books uh, when you're gonna see. He played with a home run hitting first baseman veteran, a guy named John Mayberry. And Danny says to John Mayberry at the end of the season, 
It's like Labor Day. They got a month left in the baseball season. The Blue Jays are in last. He says, hey, Big John, you got 30 home runs and, you know, 95 RBIs. If you have a good September, you'll end up with a 110 RBIs and 35, 35, 36 homers. And, and Mayberry smoking a cigarette back in those days in the <laughs> locker room. Takes a big drag and says, nope. He says, pup. He says, no way. He says, I'm closing the books. <laughs> he says, if I do that this year, they want more next year. And so Danny says at the, at the end of the, uh, um, it's sure enough at the end of the regular season, he had like one more homer and five more RBIs. And so Danny told the story to us and Max loved that story. And so Max was going to be a free agent. And uh, uh, we're playing Cleveland. They got Lonnie Shelton, big, burly, strong, big forward, bruising guy. And, uh, and and Max is going to be a free agent and says, we said, so Max, well, you're going to, you got to guard Lonnie tonight. You're going to be, uh, you know, how are you going to go? He's going to be a free agent next year. He says, he says nope. He says, I'm closing the books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get out of this game pretty quickly somehow. So I said, I don't want to get hurt. You know, he was saying he didn't want to get hurt with this, this, this contract they're negotiating. So then the next year we're playing him again. Max has signed the contract and uh, we said, <laughs> we said, uh, so Max, you still going to play Lonnie Sheldon still playing. He said, he says, yeah, I'm playing, man. He can hurt you. So, <laughs> so <laughs> he was joking, but you know, he said, Hey, I got the contract now. If I get hurt, so what? <laughs> so. That's fantastic. Well, Greg, thank you so much for your time. All the best and uh, good luck in your game tonight. Thank you. Good luck with your, uh, broadcast and uh, look forward to maybe listening to some of your other podcasts all right well thank you take care okay you're welcome care